All right, guys, so the next part in um, chapter six that will be part of the quiz and, and all over the exam, AP exam, is actually dealing with something that's going to um, be rather critical for you to avoid falling into a lot of the dumb Facebook shares um, traps that are going on and um, really, I think, will help make sense of a lot of things and, and put you in a class of people that are far more educated about how things work. And that is today that we're going to talk about how political scientists um, correctly measure public opinion, right? Because there's lots of bad ways and terrible ways to do it where we can change wording or change how we ask a question or, you know, change how we sample people. And suddenly, you know, I could say that, you know, 99% of people favor, uh, shoot, something terrible. I don't know. Um, but it doesn't work that way. So let's take a look at how it does work. So first... Um, the, the basic question is how are polls conducted, right? So as part of the presidential, um, what, some of the exam or project, rather, um, you're going to be, you poll multiple different times what's going on in the presidential election, right? Like, what do the polls say? Um, have you stopped and thought about how they work, right? Like, how are people, are they just, you know, randomly calling people? And so, um the, the simple fact of the matter is, is that asking everyone in America what their opinion is, is logistically impossible, right? I mean, even if you wanted to get a 1% of America, you would spend months trying to reach out to people and call people, right? And so the census alone takes years and costs $800 million. So asking people their opinion is, is not going to work. But... Politicians and government um, are oftentimes very interested in understanding where the public stands on an issue or where the public stands on a candidate. And so what they do instead is they rely on a population sample, right, that if they can um, secure a sample of the human population that's big enough to represent the whole, then you can be fairly well assured that what you're going to find in those results um, has some logistical or statistical, rather, um, purpose, right? And so if we are talking about how, like, what size sample do you need to get before you can actually start to see a mathematical correlation between what the general public thinks, statisticians have found that generally, so long as you use a truly random sample, right, meaning a truly random sample, everyone in America has an equal chance of being sampled here, that so long as you use a truly random sample, mathematicians and statisticians find that a sample of around 1,000 to 1,500 people can secure a reasonable, uh, you know, r rate of error. Um, and so we have to, the major parts of conducting polls is um, the fact that polls and, and sampling needs to be random. And we're going to look at lots of case studies where political science tied, you know, tried to overthink things. And they tried to use a quota method, right, where they said, well, you know, 16% of, uh, you know, America is black and 21% is Latino and 51% is female and, you know, 18% uh, are old. And so why don't we just create a sample where we have... Um, basically those numbers captured. And that doesn't work, right? And there's a lots of, of really interesting statistical reasons why that doesn't work. But the, the simplest way of securing a sample is actually mathematically found to be the most viable, which is um, we need to have every person in America has an equal probability of being selected for the poll, right? And so random sample, when it's done well, um, represents the whole. So 1,500 people can can stand in and tell you what do the 350 million Americans believe about an issue. Um, it's not perfect. And as you can see here on the, the bottom, um, if you look at the, the bar graph here or the line graph, you'll see a correlation between margin of error on the um, x-axis and size of the sample on, on the y, right? And so we want to get the margin of error as low as possible, right? So if I do a poll, but there's a 35.9% margin of error, then if I tell you there's a, you know, 
64% chance that you're going to win the lottery today, but oh, by the way, there's a 35% margin of error, then suddenly your your chance of actually winning the lottery becomes much less convincing, right? Because it could be 100% or it could be 30%. Um, so we want to get the margin of error um, as low as possible, right? If we can get the margin of error low, then we can have more confidence in our results. And so what you'll notice in the chart here is that the larger the sample gets, the you know the smaller the margin of error. And so when you start sampling 50 people, at 50 people, the margin of error is 15.4%. Meaning if you say 50% um, of Americans or 52% of Americans support you know, Joe Biden, but oh, by the way, there's a 15% margin of error, then really what you're saying is 67% could support Joe Biden, but also 37% um, could also support Joe Biden, right? And so we want to get that margin of error low. If you look at if you can get the sample size to around 1,000, it's only 3.4%. Meaning if I tell you 52% of you know people support Joe Biden, it's either 55 or 49. That's not terrible. We can, we can learn stuff from that result. If I can get it even bigger and create a, a truly random sample that is 4,000 people strong, there at the bottom right, you can see the margin of error drops to 1.7%. And so, you know, what we need to really focus on in order to be educated consumers of polling information, as we see it in the news and shared on Facebook and whatnot, you know, where we say, you know, 65% of Americans favor a return to dictatorship, right? Or 86% of Americans would like to see Colorado, uh, you know, removed from the nation, right? And so, a lot of times we see crap like that on the internet, and if we do a little digging, we see that, okay, this is a credibly flawed poll. They didn't go with a random sample. They posted it on a specific website for people that already believe something, and they asked you know, certain people to respond. And, oh, by the way, the sampling error is 57%. So all polls maintain sampling error. The larger the poll, the smaller the sample error. And this is the level of confidence that we should have in the accuracy of results. But if pollsters and statisticians um, do their job right, right, and we can get the sample error pretty low, then really when we look at the results, like we can say, okay, well, that's that's pretty good results, right? And so, um, it, you know, plus or minus 3% is kind of the gold standard. It's what statisticians are really shooting for. If you can get the margin of error under 3%, then that tells you something. It doesn't really tell you if, you know, let's take the current election in the state of North Carolina, there is a Senate election um, where uh, Cunningham is running against Senator Tillis. Cunningham is currently up on Tillis 51 to 49, right? And so you see that and you say, oh, Cunningham's winning. He's in the lead 52 to 40 or 51 to 49. But then you look and you say, oh, wait, there's a plus or minus 3% margin of error. So Tillis could actually be winning, right? Because that 49 could become 52, and Cunningham could drop from 51 to 48, right? And so, you know, we want to get it pretty low. 3% is generally seen as acceptable. And if, a, you know, again, just the data to kind of exemplify what I'm saying, if a poll says 60% will vote for Clinton, it basically means 57 to 63% likelihood, right? And so continuing how our polls conducted, right, we need to kind of close, more closely examine, okay, so you're doing a random sampling where, where everyone in America has an equal shot of being um, selected. What else do we need to do to make sure that the poll is valid? We need proper sampling techniques. Right, and so proper sampling techniques is actually even more important than sample size. And there has been many times in history where you know polls will say, "Well, we had thirty thousand people respond to this poll," and you think, "Whoa, that's a huge poll. It must be really, you know, really low margin of error." But then you look and you say, "Well, wait a second. What were your sampling techniques?" And you look and you see um, that they did incredibly stupid things. So no matter how big the sample was the poll is still going to be flawed. And this is best exemplified in, in something like in 1936, 
there was a poll out that incorrectly predicted that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was going to lose the election by 19%. But the poll was actually secured um, to reader, Reader's Digest subscribers. And so it was specifically, you know, sent out to Reader's Digest subscribers. And everyone who subscribed to Reader's Digest would fill out this poll and send it back to them. And they'd use that. And they said, well, we got 75,000 responses. And it looks like FDR is going to lose by 19%. Well, what they found was that Reader's Digest subscribers were disproportionately wealthy, right? They were white and wealthy and you know trended to favor in certain parts of the country and so when we actually looked at it it was like well you know fdr's major support was working class individuals with his new deal and so all these rich people said they, they're not going to vote for him didn't actually make a good poll and so really what pollsters do today and you can see it in the bottom right hand picture is they rely on random digit dialing Right, meaning the pollsters have programs where um, every time they hang up the phone, it randomly dials another set of numbers somewhere in the country, right? And somebody picks up and says, "I can't do it. I'm busy eating dinner," and click onto the next person. But if they do this random digit dialing long enough, where they have a poll out in the field long enough, that they can usually get a thousand to fifteen hundred people to say. Sure, I'll answer your questions. And this random sampling um, is generally pretty representative of the national sample. And so, like I said, knowing how polls work will free you from taking the results as fact and allow you to not be sheep, right? And so now let's take a look. Okay, polls work through randomness. You need a, a big sample size. You need to make sure the language in your poll is not leading people like let's take a look at the bottom if the election were held today would you a vote against republicans b throw the corrupt evil bums out or c banish the gop to everlasting scorn and ridicule right like there's lots of polls um that are worded like that and they're obviously ridiculous and tell you nothing um you see them on the internet all the time where it's like do you think a donald trump is doing a fantastic job B, a good job, C, uh, uh, no, an okay job, or D, um, you prefer not to say, right? And, and then they're, you're like, okay, well, what if you think he's doing a bad job? Um, so now let's take a look at how these polls actually impact our democracy. Um, and so number one, um, let's take a look at the poll, the pros, right? What is the opt? The data, what does the science say is good about polls? and democracy number one right we see actually here and this is a glass half full or glass half empty depends on how cynical you want to be is that number one fundamentally they allow the public's wishes to be heard um in between elections right if the only time the public actually got to get to kind of express what they believed was at an election then basically all throughout the year or every other, you know, every two years, if it's a congressional election, every four years, if it's presidential, right? We don't really know what the public believes or what they want. And so by using polls, um, political organizations and political parties and newspapers and media outlets can essentially get a pretty good read on what the public believes and what they want. So, okay, now you've, you've got this good idea of what the public believes and what the public wants. What do you do with it? And the fact of the matter is, is that, honestly, the biggest impact of polls is it allows politicians to strategically craft their message, right? If they know that they're trying to get, um, you know, health care reform passed, and they find out that when they use the word Obamacare, that it polls significantly worse than if they say the Affordable Care Act, guess what they're going to start calling it? The Affordable Care Act, right? And so politicians begin to kind of craft their message in ways that they believe the public will hear them better, right? And so certainly they know what phrases to avoid. They know where, you know, if I really want to pass tax reform, but I know that, you know, Americans right now believe that rich people get all sorts of tax breaks and, and poor people get screwed, then I'm going to make sure that if I, you know, in tax law and, and as I'm speaking and selling this, that I'm going to, you know, craft my message that way. 
Now the con of this is is pretty obvious, right? And we'll pick that up in part two.